Thank you, Chairperson. Good evening, everyone. First of all, I thank the organizers for giving us the opportunity to present our data in this forum. Today, I shall be talking about the haploidentical transplantation PTCY based in relapsed refractory acute myeloid leukemia. We all know the patient who are not in CR1, whether you do T cell deplete or T cell replete transplantation, the outcome is much inferior as compared to CR1. So 40% of the patient are not going to respond with the induction chemotherapy. Among the responders, 60 to 70% of patients are going to relapse. And among the relapse group, only 20 to 30% patients are fortunate enough to achieve CR2. So the main challenge in front of transplant community is how to give the better outcome in case of these cases. So with that background, we have started our transplantation with 51 relapse refractory acute myeloid leukemia. And that is what we are trying to address in our study, that how can we improve the outcome in these relapsed refractory out leukemia. The median age was 23 years, varying from 2 to 65. The maternal donor was 45%. The primary in refractory disease was 63%, and the 37% of patients had the relapse. 57% of the patient had adverse feature in the form of monosomy, complex karyotyping, and FLIT3 mutation. The percentage of blast at the time of transplantation was 15%. We also look into the comorbidity index, which was more than one was 17% of the patient. More than 75% of the patient had complete HLA mismatch, complete half HLA mismatch. We also looked into the NK cell genotype and phenotype and tried to find out the NK KIR ligand mismatch donor in the form of C1, C2, and BW4. The 59% of the patients had NK KIR ligand mismatch donor. We also looked into the NKKIR haplotype, and 77% patients had the haplotype B. At the same time, we looked into the high B score. 50% of the patient had the high B score, and 43% of the patient had major and minor mismatch, ABO mismatch blood group. The median CD34 count in the graph was 7.75 median, varying from 3 to 14.4. So engraftment was not a problem. The median days of neutrophil and the platelet engraftment was 14 days. I am describing the outcome of whole of the cohort at initially, and then I'll go to the three sequential study which we have gone through. The incidence of acute GVSD was 33.9%, and the chronic GVSD was 13.9%. The NRM was 11.1%, but the relapse, as we know, these all patients are refractory and the relapse disease, so 45.8%. The incidence of overall survival was 51.9%. We also looked into the HCTCI, female to male blast percentage at the time of transplantation and ABO mismatch. These did not have any impact on overall survival. The, coming to the disease status, although the primary refractory disease intended to have better survival, but they were not statistically significant. So with that, we have started our haploidentical transplantation program. With the first protocol, we have condition in a plastic phase, keeping the Johns Hopkins skeletal intact. 
we had replaced bone marrow with the PBSC and TBI with the melphalan and tacrolimus with the cyclosporine. As we expected, the, these patients are going to relapse, so we had employed the donor lymphocyte infusion of 1 million per kilogram on day 35, 60, and 90. So with this protocol, we had done 10 patients. Engraftment was not a problem, neither the acute GVSD nor chronic GVSD. But yes, 90% of the patient had relapsed and none show NRM. So what we had concluded with this protocol that reduced intensity conditioning is not sufficient for these relapsed refractory acute myeloid leukemia. And the most importantly and interestingly, PTCY induces very early and strong tolerance which can't be bridged by this low dose DLI. So we moved on to the another protocol, made this as a myeloablative <coughs> by escalating dose of melphalan and the busulfone. With this protocol, we have published our data in the pediatric population. And we had employed with this 20 patients, all of them engrafted. The incidence of acute GVSD was 50%. Maybe it could be because this uh, protocol had the more of the children and that we have presented in our poster on first day, so I'm not going to in detail about this. The chronic GVSD was one patient. NRM was two out of 20 patients. And yes, relapse was seen in nine patients out of 20. So what we come to the conclusion with is that, that this has Myeloablative condition has improved disease-free survival with low NRM. The acute GVSD was mild, but the chronic GVSD was virtually absent. And low-dose DLI did not improve the relapse rate, but did not cause GVSD either. So following non-myeloablative conditioning, and so in the next protocol, we had employed donor lymphocyte infusion preemptively with an escalated dose. Because the rational, was, rational for this was we hypothesized that there might be an opportunity to explore the GVL effect of DLI following myeloablative conditioning. So, we had employed escalated dose of DLI starting from the day 21 post-transplantation and then day 35 and then day 60. Day 35 and 60 had 5 million cells we gave and keeping the other elements same. What we noticed in this, the incidence of acute GVST was not more than the without DLI, but yes, the chronic GVST was markedly high in the conditioning regime and myeloablative with DLI. And that possibly translated into the reduced incidence of relapse rate that is only 18%. As compared to the non-myeloablative with DLI, that was 90%, and the myeloablative without DLI was 43%. The non-relapse mortality was also comparable among all the three protocols. The overall survival of one year was 82% and the two year overall survival was 78%. But the caveat of this study is follow up is short and we have to still wait for the another couple of months to come to a final conclusion. But yes, till date, the findings are interesting. We had also looked into the NK ligand mismatch donor. And what we found that the, if you have NK ligand mismatch donor, the chance of relapse reduces. 
At the same time, we had compared the both recent cohort myeloablative with TLI and without TLI. If you have ankle ligand mismatch donor, myeloablative without TLI, then it helps in reduction of relapse. But if you don't have the NK ligand mismatch toner, the DLI might work. So we did the univariant analysis and what all the factors come up. Those are the three factors, the conditioning with and without DLI, NK ligand mismatch toner, and the chronic GVSD. But when we did the multivariant analysis, to find the impact on relapse and the overall survival, it was only one factor which has come up, that is conditioning, myeloablative conditioning with DLI. So finally, I'll conclude by saying that PTCY-based haploidentical transplantation with myeloablative conditioning is feasible in relapsed refractory AML with low incidence of NRM. Early DLI following myeloablative conditioning reduces relapse and it improves the disease-free survival. However, the follow-up is short. Chronic GVSD and not the acute GVSD following early DLI increased without compromising the quality of life. And NK ligand mismatch donor might improve disease-free survival in the absence of DLI, but if you don't have NK ligand mismatch donor, DLI definitely work. So I thank my BMT team, each and every member, and I thank Dr. Chakravarti who had started, initiated haploidentical transplant program in India. Thank you all for patient listening. <laughs> We have, we have time for maybe one or two questions. Uh, I, may, I may start uh, by asking, um, if I understand correctly, this it's sort of an aggregate analysis of several you know, serial independent trials. Yeah. And, and I'm wondering, um, have, have you looked at the individual characteristics of patients in each one of these trials? Uh, do they differ in important ways, such as See, you know, the, the stage of the disease, uh, their, their treatment uh, response, the, the burden of blast, these types of yeah, things? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. We, we had seen, when we started, it was, the, uh, it was the time when no would like to go through this transplantation, haploidentical transplantation, because it was considered as a very, very risky procedure, and at that time in, in India, it was considered as sacrilege. So when we had started, it was all relapsed, full low blast percentage patients. So, uh, and then gradually we go on, gone through this protocols and we yes, we have seen everything. My, my concern was just are it the patients mean, in these individual trials comparable or do they differ in important ways? Different pardon? Pardon? Are they the same same patient eligibility criteria? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All of them had the same eligibility. They all are relapsed, refractory, acute male. They all follow up in the same categories of the patients. And you administered your DLI in the setting of immune suppression. You did not rapidly yeah, treat with immune suppression. Yeah, we did not. Yeah, uh, we had continued the cyclosporine and MMF. And the third protocol, we had tried to stop tapers the uh, cyclosporine after day 90 and the truncated the MMF till day 35. If the patient did not develop the acute GVHD, so this was the. Okay, well, thank you very much.